All right, just hit record. So everybody approve. <laughs> and so I'm going to use a, a, a passion, one of the usual passion collects to begin today. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose most dear son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain and entered not into glory before he was crucified, mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord. Amen. Today we begin the passion narrative um, with 11.1 uh, in your Bible. Um, and so just to sort of reorient you again, the discipleship catechism is over, and we'll see if the disciples are up already, if they've uh, gotten the point um, and are, are ready for the challenge of Jerusalem. Um, but whether they are or not, the time has come. Um, the, uh, and, we, and that's marked by Mark um, with the story of the second blind man in 1046. They come to Jericho, not far from Jerusalem. I'm hearing a, I'm hearing background noise somewhere. Are you all hearing an echo? I think, okay, now it's gone. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Matthew, miracle worker. <laughs> okay. Um, as I was saying, um, in 10, 1046, we hear the end of the discipleship cate catechism, uh, the Mark and Middle section. Uh, roughly uh, eight, middle of eight to end of chapter 10. And uh, the disciples are now in Jericho. And as Jesus and his and a large crowd are leaving Jericho, Bar Timaeus, son of Timaeus, that's what Bar Timaeus means, a blind beggar is sitting by the roadside, by the road. He's not on the way, not on the road, but by the road. When he heard it was Jesus, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. They told him to shut up, but he cried out even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped, said, call him here. They called the blind man. Take heart, get up. He's calling you. So throwing off his cloak, the only thing he has to protect himself, he springs up and comes to Jesus, finding his way through a crowd of people towards where he heard the voice. Amazing courage. Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The same question he had asked James and John. Their answer was a little different from his, you'll remember. And, but the blind man says, my teacher, let me see again. Jesus said, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately, he regained his sight and followed him on the way. So this blind Bartimaeus uh, becomes a disciple, um, follows him follows Jesus on the way. So we're on the way to Jerusalem, but now we're, we're practically there. We're practically in Jerusalem. It's the Passover festival, one of the three great festivals of the Jewish calendar year when all Jewish men are supposed to be in Jerusalem. But this is the big one of the three. Um, any, if you can possibly get to Jerusalem, you go for the Passover festival, the great freedom festival. It's also the time when people remember freedom and slavery, Pharaoh and Egypt and slavery under Pharaoh and how God uh, saved the people um, and rescued them from slavery in Egypt. So it's like their 4th of July. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's revolutionary. It's it's when people think about regaining their freedom again. Um, I, um, at the Beinecke Library in, in uh, Yale, I'm aware that on July 5th, the day after July 4th, of course, um, they not only read the declaration, the, the 1776 Declaration of Independence, but then they read a, a commentary by Frederick Douglass called, uh, What is the Fourth of July? to the slave in the United States. They read the, those two documents together. Um, something like that's going on in the mindset of the, of the Jewish people enslaved by Roman occupiers in the first century, the second temple period 
um, up until 70 when the temple is destroyed by the Romans. Um, so the, um, the focus of the pilgrimage festival is the temple. Pilgrims are coming from miles and miles of Jews. Rome is like a magnet at this point, and they have revolutionary feelings. They hate Rome. <laughs> they hate Roman oppression. They hate the taxation system. They hate the way that a Roman soldier can just grab you and make you do whatever they need done. Carry something, carry a cross even. Um, so um, they, can, they can do whatever they want with you because they are the occupying power. Because uh, Passover is the time when people get ideas and by the way, I should say, especially Galilee was famous for producing Galilean hotheads, people who thought they were the Messiah, people who thought maybe they were God's chosen person to end Roman oppression. And what better time to do it than Passover? There had been quite a few of these, it's the technical term is messianic pretenders, people who claimed to be the Messiah or people who other people said, maybe they didn't claim it themselves, but other people said they were Messiah. What happened to them? They all ended up dead. Most of them uh, crucified because that's how Rome killed enemies of Rome. And if you think you're a king or if you think you're God's chosen person to free uh, the people uh, from Roman oppression, you are an enemy of Rome and that's how you're going to die. <clears throat> so all of this is in the background. The other thing we should say is that for every Passover, Pilate, Pontius Pilate, the governor, of Judea at the time brings in extra troops. They're not stupid. They know that there are going to be crowds and crowds of pilgrims in the city for the Passover festival, that they're going to be thinking about freedom. They're going to have freedom on their minds and that they are going to gather around anybody who looks like they might have the power to overthrow Rome. And that's all it takes to get riots in the streets. And, and Pilate's job is to keep the peace in Jerusalem, that's his. That's what he's supposed to do. So he knows what to do. He brings in lots of extra troops and they're everywhere. The, the soldiers are everywhere and the temple police are particularly uh, watching people. Uh, the, the mood, even before the passion narrative starts, is loaded. It's just absolutely tense about as, if you can manage, a, if you can um, <clears throat> think about a city that is occupied and there's a chance to finally get free. Um, that's how tense it is. Um, <clears throat> so when, when we get to, so our story begins here in, in chapter 11, one, um, when they are approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the mouth of Mount of Olives. Um, Bethany, Beth means house. Bethlehem is the house of bread. Um, Beth Ani, I think it's the house of I am, Ani, um, um, I think Ani means I am, and so that would be the Aramaic name for the, the uh, uh, Exodus 3, 6 story of Moses and the burning bush, um, I am who I am, or I will be who I will be, so another way of saying house of God or house of the name of God. Beth Fege is interesting. Um, scholars have not been able to figure out exactly where it is. And that's significant because Beth Fagi means house of unripe figs. I just want you to file that information away for a few minutes in your head. I promise you it will come in handy in a minute. So they are approaching Jerusalem at Beth Fagi and Bethany near the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent away, sends out his disciples, uh, two of them, and says, go into the city, um, and immediately as you enter it, you will find there a colt that's never been written, untie it and bring it. Jesus says immediately, and we're aware that it's one of Mark's favorite words, but I also want to say something else about the passion narrative, and this is about the literary, the way it works as a literary um, uh, piece. All the way through Mark's gospel, we've been on a fast train that you cannot get off. Everything's happening immediately. It's, it's a loud gospel. There have been screaming demons, family arguments, um, uh, all kinds of, of exorcisms um, and, and healings uh, and angry crowds and crowds needing healing and con a few controversy stories. Um, but And it's all been fast. 
Then, then on the way to Jerusalem, a quick catechism for the disciples, only three chapters. Luke gives us 10 chapters of Jesus' teaching and parables on the way to Jerusalem. <clears throat> but in Mark, <clears throat> sorry about it. <clears throat> okay, that's better. In Mark, we only have time for three chapters of discipleship catechism. We're, on, we're in a hurry. We're on the way, on the way, on the way, in a hurry. But suddenly, when we get to Jerusalem, it's the whole mood is different. The literary mood is different. And it's like from a, a fast film, like the Keystone Cops, everything's too fast, um, to stills. So we see when we get to the passion narrative, what happens is that the camera gives us stills and close-ups. We feel, especially towards the end of the passion narrative, we hear every word, we feel every blow. We are just aware of being there in the moment because so much attention is paid to every detail in the story. Part of that's because this story, as painful as it is, is much beloved by Christians. We tell it over and over again. Every Sunday, we start with the end of the story. On the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And every year, we enact, we read twice the Passion narrative in, on Palm Passion Sunday, and we read it again on Good Friday, God's Friday. Um, and so we are very, uh, we know this story very well. And Mark's community would have known it very well too. This is not new information to them. This, this gospel is written for insiders who love to tell the story, even though it's a painful, horrible story, um, but it's our story. It's the story of our Lord Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. And so every detail matters. And so uh, we're, we're going to be paying a lot of attention to details. Jesus sent two disciples. You, they will, you will find there a colt that's never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. And if anyone says, why are you doing this? Just say, the Lord needs it. And we'll send it back here immediately. Sure enough, they went away, found a colt. And somebody in the, in the crowd said, what do you think you're doing untying that colt? And they said, they told, they said what they were supposed to say. And, um, and so they were allowed to take it. They brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it. He sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road and, and spread, others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the field. This is to make the equivalent of a red carpet. This is a, welcome, a gesture of incredible welcome to take off your, your clothes, cover the road with them, and leafy branches to cover the road with them so that uh, God's um, anointed can come in. Uh, so those who got, went ahead of the procession, those who were behind the, 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 um, the Jesus and the uh, disciples, um, Jesus on a, a colt, the colt of a donkey, um, are, are, um, are shouting. What are they shouting? They're shouting Psalm 118, Hosanna, Hoseana, Hoseana, save us, we pray, is what it means. Hoseana, save us, we pray. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. This is a political demonstration as well as a theological demonstration. It would be the, the kingdom of David um, is gone. The divided kingdom of David and Solomon is, is over. Um, and there hasn't been any, any, uh, any king of Israel uh, for many, many years. It's been a succession of one ruling, occupying power over another, and the Romans are the worst of, of the bunch. But this is the, one of the, what the pilgrims say when they come into Jerusalem. So Jesus looks like a, an important pilgrim coming into the city um, on, on the back of a donkey, um, <clears throat> and the people are chanting Psalm 118, <clears throat> blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Is Jesus a second David? Is Jesus coming to finally get, get rid of these lousy Romans? And um, is this going to be the greatest thing ever? 
um, the, the procession that welcomes him into Jerusalem thinks so. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he'd looked around at everything as it is already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. I, I wish I could make the noise for you of a balloon. A great big uh, fizzle out. If it was a great political, it fit, just fizzled out like, like rain coming down on a beautiful uh, parade. Um, nothing happening here. Um, Jesus should have gone in and what, occupied the temple or used it as a fortress over against the, what was, what's not, something not right here, not happening. The next day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see whether perhaps he would find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves because it wasn't the season for figs. The word here is kairos, not, not chronos. It's not, we're not talking about clock time. We're talking about God's time or the season when God appoints figs to, to um, appear on a fig tree. Um, and it's not the right time for figs. He said, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. I imagine that they would make, that would make them a little nervous. <laughs> but uh, we'll see. All right. Then they came to Jerusalem. By the way, this is a Mark and Sandwich. We call your attention to. So this is part one, fig tree story, part one. Then here's what's in the middle. They came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. He turned over the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He wouldn't let anyone carry anything through the temple. You, have, you need to be able to carry vessels and, and other things to the temple. He stopped all that, he stopped, entirely stopped the temple operation. He was teaching and saying, isn't it written in scripture, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Yes, it is written, to answer Jesus' question, it is written in scripture. It's Isaiah 56, 7. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. And the second half is taken right out of Jeremiah's temple sermon, or maybe we should call it Jeremiah's anti-temple sermon. If we go back to Jeremiah 7, and I actually suggest that you do that on your own, and read Jeremiah's sermon, um, Temple Sermon, which is a, a, a prophetic protest against the temple authorities. Um, he is the, it's Jeremiah's language. You have made it a den of thieves. In Jeremiah's context, he's saying that the rulers of the people have exploited them and then hidden out in the temple to cover themselves. Um, in Jesus' context, he's quoting, and the other thing Jeremiah said is, you think that saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord is going to protect you from the Babylonians. Wake up and smell the Babylonians. They're right outside your gate. You're about to be to go into to exile. The Babylonians are about to destroy the temple. They're going to, to um, break up all, your, all the ruling families of Israel. They're all going to be led into exile. Um, and this, that's what happened. Jeremiah could see, read the signs of the times. So Jeremiah's temple sermon does two things. It, it castigates, punishes the leaders um, of the temple, um, at, who are the leaders of the people, for not obeying God's word. And he warns them that because of that and because of, of the um, of, of God's anger at the temple authorities, uh, they will not be protected by saying the temple of the Lord a couple of times. The Babylonians are going to come and wipe out the temple. God will allow his temple to be destroyed. Um, that, that's what the leaders were saying. God will never let, let his own temple be destroyed. Jeremiah says, uh, have you been to Shiloh lately? You know, that place where God had a temple, he allowed the temple there to be destroyed. He can allow this temple to be destroyed as well. And sure enough, it was destroyed by the Babylonians. Okay, so what's Jesus doing? He's saying, "My house is this house is supposed to be a house of prayer for all the nations. You have made it a den of thieves. When the chief priests and the scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him. 
they were afraid of him because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went back out of the city. So the confrontation that the people were expecting on the day that he entered the city of Jerusalem was not with the Romans. It was with the leadership of the temple. So that's uh, curve one in the story. All right, so that's the middle part of the Mark and Sandwich. Now we come to fig tree story part two. In the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. Then Peter remembered and said, Peter's the one who always says, is always up first, and he always speaks for the disciples, what they're all thinking, Peter says. Peter remembered, it's, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus answers, duh, <laughs> or the, the equivalent of that, says, yeah, have faith in God. Truly, I tell you, if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea. And if you do not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. So I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have already received it and it will be yours, a very strong promise. Then he adds, whenever you stand praying, forgive. And if you have anything against anyone, for, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. This is the closest we get to the Lord's Prayer in Mark's gospel. Um, remember that Mark is the earliest gospel. Um, it's hard to know uh, how old the Lord's Prayer is, but by the time of Matthew, probably about 15 years after Mark, the Lord and Luke about the same time, the Lord's Prayer is much more fully developed. But we know from the fact that it appears in two different forms in Matthew and in Luke, the church, by the way, says the one in Matthew, um, that it, it isn't fixed, it isn't entirely fixed by the time we get to, say, 85. But it becomes, it's very old. Um, the last part, the doxology at the end, was added a little bit later. Um, but the, the everything else that what we say in the Lord's Prayer up to de deliver us from evil um, is, uh, is there in Matthew's gospel. But in Mark's gospel, all we have is this, this reference to it. Um, if you have anything against anyone, forgive so that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. And we can't tell from this whether Mark and the people are already saying the Lord's Prayer Mark's community are already saying it, and math, Mark's just making a reference to it, and they're supposed to fill in the rest of it, or whether this is all we have so far, and it develops between um, somewhere between 70 and 85. It doesn't matter. It just we'd like it's one of the many things we'd like to know that we don't know. So, all right, they came again. Now, I want to just say something about the poor fig tree. Um, but before you um, decide to join the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Fig Trees, um, I want to tell you something else about this passage. And you can't really see it until you go back to the scripture that Jesus is quote is is or that Mark is quoting here. Most most people who hear this story have no idea what's going on, and that's because they don't know the secret, the key. The key um, is happens in Jeremiah 8.13. Um, and so if, if, if Jeremiah's temple sermon is Jeremiah 7, right after Jeremiah 7 comes Jeremiah 8. No great surprise there. And when you get to Jeremiah 8.13, um, he's still preaching. This is what you get. When I wanted to gather them, says the Lord, there are no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree. Even the leaves are withered. Now, that's not an accident, okay? That's uh, what's going on here, um, but it takes a minute to explain it. So the, um, and the, and the, and the easiest way to explain it is actually to pick up on the grapes. 
there are no grapes on the vine nor figs on the fig tree. So I want you to, if you have a Bible open and it's handy, flip for a minute. You don't need to go to, to Jeremiah 8, 13. I, I just read it to you. But go back to Isaiah 5, 1 through 7 for a minute. And hear the very famous song of the vineyard. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones, planted it with choice vines, built a watchtower in the middle of it, hewed out a wine vat in it, expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now I'm going to take my vineyard to court, says God. Inhabitants of Jerusalem, people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard that I didn't do for it? I did everything a vineyard should ever want. When I wanted it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I'll tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard, says God. I'm going to remove its hedge. It's going to be devoured. I'm going to break down its wall. It's going to be trampled down. I'll make it a waste. It won't be pruned or, pruned or honed. It'll be overgrown with briars and thorns. Thorns and thistles, by the way, is a reference to Genesis 3. That's what Adam is going to get when he tries to raise crops. He's going to get thorns and thistles. I will also command the clouds that they don't rain any rain on it. And here's the key language for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, mishpat, but saw bloodshed, mishpah. He expected righteousness, tzedakah, but what he heard was a cry, tzedakah. Do you hear how close the words are? Uh, these are, this is a double pun between justice, it, it's supposed to be justice, and you get a word that sounds, that sounds like justice, but actually it means bloodshed. God expects righteousness, but instead he hears the cry of the oppressed. So this is, this is God's case against Israel. In this case, it's God's case against the temple authorities uh, who are misleading the people of Israel. God comes to the vineyard. The vineyard is the house of Israel. Um, and, they, um, and there are no grapes. It's supposed to yield grapes. And instead, God gets sour grapes, wild grapes. And he wants to, he, God comes to the fig tree and expects figs, um, but no figs. So this is about the justice that God expects from uh, the land leased temporarily to the rulers of the temple of Israel, and they're not producing the fruits of justice and righteousness. Uh, and so the leaves of the fig tree are withered. It's, as I say, most people read this story and they're totally confused. It, um, one biblical scholar e even describes this as Jesus' temple tantrum, um, <laughs> which I kind of like. But, it, it, but that's what you have when you're a two-year-old and you, lose, you totally lose control and you start screaming and, and throwing things. That's not really what's going on. This, what's really going on is that it's a replay of Jeremiah's temple sermon and a warning that the temple could very well be destroyed by the Romans. All right. Uh, they Again, I'm now on 1127. Again, they came to Jerusalem as he was walking in the temple. The nerve, say the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. And they say, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do that? What the hell do you think you're doing, buddy? You will remember that they, way earlier in the gospel, Jesus, when Jesus was reading and interpreting the scripture, he did so as one with authority and not as the scribes. Remember that line? It happens a couple of times. Once, I think, in chapter two and, and once in chapter six, um, Jesus has authority. All right. Who gave you this authority? Well, the answer for us is obvious. Jesus is a, is. Uh, this is a prophetic action. Jesus is speaking like Jeremiah, warning the people and warning the leaders that the temple is about to be destroyed. Um, but Jesus, here we go. Jesus says, okay, uh, I'm going to ask you one question. Tell me the answer to the question, and then I will tell you by what authority I'm doing this. 
the baptism of John, did it come from heaven or was it of human origin? Oh, they go into a huddle. They go into a huddle and they say, oh, wow. If we say from heaven, then he's going to say, then how come you didn't believe him? But can we really say it was of human origin? The crowd's going to, we're going to lose the crowd completely. They think John the Baptist came from John. They think he was truly a prophet. So they come out of their huddle and they say to Jesus, we don't know. And Jesus says, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. Okay, That's round one. <laughs> we have a whole bunch of these in a row here. And this is the first one. It's a stalemate. Um, they, they question his authority and he, he knows what they're up to. And so, um, so it says, no way, I won't tell you. Then we're not surprised when the next line is, then he began to speak to them in parables. Remember back in the, in the end of chapter three and the beginning of chapter four, why was Jesus beginning to speak in parables? Because he was in danger and because he, he, there was a distinction between those who had the mysterion, the secret of the reign of God, his disciples, the insiders, and everybody else. To everybody else, got, uh, he was speaking in parables. Um, so Jesus goes back into speaking in parables mode. Um, it's a parable that um, we'll comment on in a minute, but let's hear it first. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a pit for the wine press and built a watchtower. Does that sound familiar? It's right out of Isaiah 5. And leased it to the tenants and went to another country. When the season came, again, it's Kairos, when the time, the time comes, the, the fruits are due, the tenants are supposed to come up, the tenants take care of the land, and they're supposed to give the fruit of the land, what they've been uh, growing, to the landowner when the landowner comes in, at the end of the season. He sent a slave to the tenants to collect from them his share of the produce of the vineyard, but they seized and beat him, sent him away with nothing. Again, he sent another slave to them. This one they beat over the head and insulted. He sent another, that one they killed. And so it was with many others. Some they beat, others they killed. Um, we're, to re, we're to think about God demanding justice and getting the, not even close from the, from the owners of the vineyard. He still had one other, a beloved son. Uh-oh. <laughs> All right. Now, this is a parable. This is not history. OK, the land, the landowner would be absolutely stupid with that kind of a record to send his beloved son to tenants. So just don't 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 look for history here, but pay attention to the language beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them saying they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, hey, this is the heir. Let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then, by the way, no tenant, ten, the tenants would have to be really stupid to think that if they killed the heir, the, vi the, the um, vineyard would be theirs. That's not how it works in any law, legal system in anywhere in the world. Um, so uh, it just doesn't, just doesn't work historically. There's something else that's going on here. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He'll come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this scripture? And here we go back to Psalm 118 again. This is the same Psalm that the pilgrims were chanting when Jesus came in on a donkey into Jerusalem. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and it is, it is the Lord's doing and it is amazing in our eyes. And Jesus stops there and the temple authorities, when they realized that he had told this parable against them, wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowd, they, not today. So they left him and went away. This is confrontation number two, <laughs> okay? Um, now let's talk about this parable a little bit. The, the fact that it's told, um, he still had one other, a beloved son, they killed, seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard is significant. It probably means that the parable that Jesus told has been modified in telling. Remember that the Gospels were originally oral. 
think about stories around a campfire, stories tend to grow. And um, the, expression, the expression beloved son, uh, we have heard twice now uh, from the voice from heaven in Mark's narrative, once at the baptism of Jesus and the other at the transfiguration story. So we know that the voice from heaven has called Jesus God's beloved son. Um, so uh, this language is absolutely loaded for Christians and that, that beloved son may or may not have been original to the story, but there's a good, get, a good bet that it has slipped into the story in Christian retelling. Another reason that I would say that is because in Matthew's version of 12.8, they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard, uh, it's reversed. They seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. If the vineyard is Jerusalem, remember that Jesus is crucified on a hill outside of the holy city. So Matthew has made the connection between um, they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard and said, no, that's not right. They seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and then killed him. So um, Mark doesn't do that, but it's significant that when it clearly, when Matthew reverses the order, he does so because he understands this to be a story about the passion and death of Jesus of Nazareth. So um, that's a, our that's our clue if we're thinking about how this story developed, that it has some layers. It has some layers that that pick up on Isaiah five, and it has a history of of how landowners and ten, tenants work in the background, but it's also a crystal, it's also being read Christologically. It's, it's unlikely that all of this was told by Jesus, but enough of it is that we're, if Jesus is still in temple, uh, is in temple confrontation mode, um, that the, um, when he realized that they told the parable against him, they wanted to kill him. They went to arrest him and kill him. Um, all right, then are you ready for round three? <laughs> this is this is all just going to be a whole series of controversies now um, in in Jerusalem with between Jesus and the temple authorities. They sent to him some Pharisees and some Herodians to trap him in what he said. Now Pharisees and Herodians don't normally talk to each other. It was back in chapter three that we had. Um, let me just check my facts here before I tell you something that isn't true. Three six. The Pharisees. I'm right. 3.6, the Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. That's the first, um, the first real death, death threat uh, to Jesus in the gospel. And I pointed it out at the time. I just want to check my, that I had the right groups here. So here they are, Pharisees and Herodians combining again to trap him in what he said. And they have a brilliant plan. Um, now, the next thing you need to know is that when people call Jesus teacher in Mark's gospel, it's not a good thing. <laughs> so uh, we have two, two in a row here, uh, but this is the first one. Te I'm going to overdo it. Teacher, we know that you are sincere and show deference to no one, for you don't regard people with partiality, but you teach the way of God in accordance with truth. Is it, watch out, when you get, when somebody comes up to you with that kind of syrup running out of their mouth, you should not walk, you should run to the nearest exit, okay? <laughs> All right, and here's what they want, here's the point, this is what, where they want to get to. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Should we pay them or should we not? Two choices, pay them, don't pay them. You tell us, oh, wise, wonderful teacher who never does anything but tell the truth. Tell us the answer. What should we do? Okay. Now, this is a nice, cunning trap. Because if Jesus said, of course, you should pay taxes to the emperor, he's going to lose the support of all the people. The Roman taxes were brutal. They were horrible. They were seriously unfair. If Jesus says, no, don't pay taxes to the empire, then he's an enemy of Rome and he's gonna end up uh, very soon on a cross. Nice, huh? Nice trap. Okay. Knowing their hypocrisy, Jesus said, why are you putting me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me see it. A denarius was the uh, day's wages. Okay, so that's a, that's a, 
50 months. It's, it's significant that Jesus didn't have one on him. He had to ask someone to bring him a denarius. Okay. So they bring him one. And he said, whose head is this? Whose, whose, whose image is it? And what is the title? What does the title say? As if he didn't have any idea. And they say, it's the emperor's, of course. It's the, the emperor's head. And, the, and, and it says the emperor's coin. Jesus said, then give to the emperor what belongs to the emperor. And give to God the things that are God's. And they were utterly amazed at him because he'd walk right out of their trap. But let's look and see what he's saying here. It's a little bit more subtle and you, you could easily miss it if you didn't think about it for a minute. It's the emperor's image on the coin. So the, emperor, the coin is made in the image of the emperor. So it belongs to the emperor. It should be given to the emperor. But people, we know from Genesis, are made in the image of God. Male and female, he created them. They are, they are all imago dei. People are made in the image of God. So give to God the things that are God's. So give Caesar his crummy coin, but don't mess with the people, Jesus is saying to the Pharisees and the Herodians. They are made in God's image, and they belong to God. Um, thank you, Matthew. Um, all right. So that's, they're utterly amazed. We have um, one more story. I think we can just do it. Some Sadducees, the ones who say there's no resurrection, say, came to him and said, Moses wrote that a man's brother dies, leaving a wife, but no child. The man should marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. And that's right. That's the Levitical marriage law. There were seven brothers. The first one married and left no children, died. The second married the widow. He died, leaving no children. This happened seven times. Last of all, the woman herself died in the resurrection. Whose wife is she going to be? All seven of them had married her. Jesus said, let's see, why are you wrong? <laughs> You're wrong because you neither know the scriptures nor the power of God. When they rise from the dead, they don't marry or are given in marriage. They're like angels. And as for the dead being raised, don't you remember in Exodus 3, how God said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's the God not of the dead. He's the God of the living. You're quite wrong. I, the point is that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were all dead when Moses saw God in the burning bush. So they are still living, and God is still living um, so this is uh, Jesus' argument for resurrection against the Sadducees. That one, I think, is not quite as compelling, um, but in its own time, maybe it was. I'm going to stop there. I think we have just um, a little bit of time for questions. Um, not much, I'm afraid. I've been blathering on, um, but let's see what we can do. There's one in the chat, I think, one or two. Let me just see if I can get in there. Um, no. Okay. Good. All right. Question. Anyone? Okay, maybe not. <laughs> well, and then it then it remains to thank you all and see you next week. We will continue. Oh, wait, wait, wait. The so Go Hi. ahead. Yes, I noticed uh, back in the story where Jesus uh, is um, answering the question about coins and images, right? There's an interesting combination of pronouns, and I don't know if that happens because it's an English translation or if that's what the Greek does as well. And it's emperor, they, rather than he. No, there's a they, switch. They answered, whose image, yes. whose head is it? The emperor's. Yes. Yeah, so who is they? The people, the, um, the, the Pharisees and Herodians. Oh, thank you. Okay. okay. I, I thank just... you. And, now, and now goodbye, and I'll see you next week. We will pick up where we left off, um, and the plot just thickens. Okay. <laughs> thank, you. Bye. thank you. Thank you.